And I have chosen for the last week, this week, and next week uh, to, to give you or to talk to you about a very unusual kind of a Christmas series or message. I had a friend ask, Rick, why in the world are you, uh, did you choose to talk about James and talk about the tongue and, and how hard it is for us to control our tongue um, during the Christmas season? Because after all, I mean, December is when you talk about baby Jesus and the manger and, and uh, you know, the wise men and all of this. And we're going to get to that. We still have a lot of month that, that uh, is left. But, you know, I answered the question very simply. I said, you know, I really feel like we need to talk about the tongue um, and we need to talk about controlling our tongues because a lot of Christians are really mouthy. And for some reason, the holidays brings out the worst in people. It brings out the worst in Christians, but it brings out the worst in people. But I'm only concerned about us as Christians. We hold each other accountable. And sometimes our mouths are just shameful. And when we get around people we say we care about or we know, sometimes people we were raised around and family, sometimes it gets worse. And, and uh, it brings out some stress, some tension. I was talking to a friend before first service. and We were talking about one of our favorite Christmas movies, uh, one of my favorite Christmas movies, Christmas Vacation. And uh, her favorite line in the movie uh, was... Um, the line where the mother tells the daughter, Audrey, uh, it's the holidays and we're all miserable and just says, get used to it. And, um, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. And, you know, we're not miserable people, but sometimes we let our attitudes just sort of get foul. And when the attitude gets foul, unfortunately, it comes out of the mouth and, you know, the mouth reveals what the heart is full of. That's what Matthew says. And so today we're going to talk about what the Bible says about our tongues. Now, anybody have trouble with their mouth? Anybody pop off? Anybody mouthy? Anybody ever say anything like uh, even recently, not like years ago, but recently even that you regret? Anybody? Just raise your hand if you're with me, okay? Some of you are very measured and cautious and careful and you don't say anything at all. You just sit there and ponder and when you do speak, it's full of wisdom and you really should be the one teaching this um, because I'm just not that guy. Um, I, I can get a little bit mouthy. I like to think out loud. Um, I can be a great strength. It can also be a great weakness. I got it from my mom. It's genetic. She's turned it into a great strength and learned how to control her tongue, but the ability for us to go back and forth and to talk. And, uh, you know, we, we did that a lot when I was growing up. And, and if we don't bridle it, if we don't watch it, we can use the same thing to destroy that we would use to build up. I had another friend who was like, man, I'm really not looking forward to Christmas holiday because um, I'm going to have to miss the family gathering this year. And they said, if you miss the family gathering this year, if you're the one who doesn't show up to the family gathering, then everybody has you for lunch and talks about you and your life and gossips. I need to be there to defend myself and protect myself. Sometimes you want to pop off when you're around people who you haven't been around in a while, who maybe push your buttons, as we said last week. Sometimes even the people who you're going to be around have installed your buttons and, um, and our mouths get us in trouble. So James, the half-brother of Jesus, talks a lot about the tongue and a lot about the mouth. And we're going to continue that today. Are you ready to continue that today? Merry Christmas. We're going to wash our mouths. That's what it's going to be all about today. We're going to wrap up our mouths, our tongues, figuratively, not literally, put a bow on them and give them to Jesus this year. And the reason is because everything that comes out of my mouth reflects on my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, with no timeouts and no breaks. People judge Jesus by the way I talk, and they judge Jesus by the way you talk as well. Now, do not think about the very superficial level and superficial things that many people think about when we're talking about talking and speech. I'm not talking about things that are obvious, like profanity and stuff like that. I'm talking about productivity. I'm talking about promoting unity. I'm talking about making Jesus, putting him in the very best light, about building people up, about being constructive, about making sure that we don't speak out of anger. What did we talk about last week? slow to speak, right? We've talked about being quick to listen, right? Slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry because human anger doesn't bring out the kind of righteousness that God deserves. Well, James only getting started in our business today like you wouldn't believe. If you wore your nice shoes today, that your toes are gonna get stepped on, you may have to clean them, get them polished after church. It's not my fault, it's just in there and I like to bring what's in there out here so that we can all sit under the authority of the word of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit, our lives can change. That's what I want today. So let's look together at this fantastic passage in James chapter three. 
a dangerous weapon kept safely stored behind walls of lips and teeth. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who's never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses, we can make them obey us. We can turn the whole animal. Now, James is increasing his um, intensity. And so increase your intensity in the way you listen to this. Or take ships as an example. Although they're so large and are driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Here he goes. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body. It sets the whole course of one's life on fire and itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. You're like, man, take a chill pill. James, we get it. But do you understand? He, he, he wants us to, to, to embrace the reality of the fact that this can be an enemy of everything that's good, constructive, productive, and right in your life. And that when this is out of control, everything's out of control. And this is really hard to keep under control. I'm that way, you're that way, we are that way. So I wanna break it down for you quickly and then really the next half of the message, we're gonna get into the, the real fun stuff, the real toe-stepping kind of stuff. And this is just sort of setting it up on a tee, but I enjoy this as well. First of all, we see that James is telling us the tongue has the power to confuse. He says, many of us should not choose to become teachers um, because you know that those who teach will be judged more strictly. So it's very simple. As Christians, we're judged by the words that come out of our mouth. So unless the words are true and correct, then we are responsible for them. Now, when I preach, I am very aware of the fact that the words that I say are, are important because many of you, when you listen to the words that I say, at least give me the benefit of the doubt that they're probably most likely coming from a source of truth from scripture and that at the end of the day that they're right and trustworthy. Now, I'm not telling you to always believe everything without checking, that would be crazy, but I'm telling you that you at least give me the benefit of the doubt. I don't give myself the benefit of the doubt. One of the most dangerous things that I could do is just grab the Bible and say, today I'm gonna to stand up and talk about what I think. That would be crazy because what I think is worthless. What I think will take you out into the woods and leave you for dead. What I do is I take what I think and I compare it and contrast it to all of the years, the hundreds and hundreds of years of scholars who have gone before me, who have had these same kinds of thoughts and talked about these same kinds of things and come to some sort of an agreement and created an environment where you know with the things that you're going to teach, the way you're going to interpret scripture is at least consistent with so many people who've gone before, who've done the same thing. And I look for that consistency for trustworthy people over the years who've come to similar and same conclusions. Because it's so important when anyone stands up and tells you this is what God is saying for it to be true and correct. Some pastors choose to use the word to coerce or control a congregation. But it's not just pastors, it's Christians who do that too. Some parents will grab scripture way out of context and use it as a manipulative tool for their kids to try to make them behave and really not only teach them a faulty view of scripture and of God, but really just a, a faulty way of looking at the world. Some people who've been Christians a little longer than others will use their knowledge of the word to bully and control and coerce others to behave in the same way that they do in things that aren't even biblical that should be left up to the discretion or the conscience of someone else and they can create entire subcultures based around this manipulation. So James says, be careful. We gotta be really careful. And he doesn't say don't teach. He just says, be cautious if you teach because you're responsible. 
And then he says, the tongue has the power to control. We all stumble in many ways. Now, if this was a traditional, uh, especially Southern Baptist church like I grew up in, when I said this, we all stumble in many ways, the congregation would have said, amen, because um, it's just a fun thing to agree with. We all stumble in many ways. Amen, Brother Rick, keep preaching. We all stumble in many ways. Isn't that weird how we say things that don't make sense anywhere except church? And, uh, but you know, all of us stumble, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, all of us. And so James is saying, remember, all of us have sin. All of us stumble in many ways. All of us need to listen to this. He's saying, listen up. He's saying, listen up. The tongue has the power to confuse, but it also has the power to control. He says, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who's never at fault in what they say is perfect, but the only perfect person who ever lived was Jesus. And so None of us are perfect. We're all at fault in the things that come out of our mouth from time to time. But just because, you know, it happens and it happens to all of us doesn't mean we're not responsible for it. But a person who's never at fault in what they say is able to keep their entire body in check. Isn't that interesting? That a person who's in control of what comes out of here James is saying, is usually in control of everything else that they may be doing with their bodies. That it's an indicator, a spiritual indicator of the quality of your relationship with the Lord, of the measure that you are being controlled by the Holy Spirit on or as an indicator of the fruit of the Spirit and how they're growing within you, this peace, this joy, this patience, these things that we can't get ourselves, but that God gives to us through our salvation that are so different than the world around us. Yet every single word that comes out of our mouth, we're responsible for, and it reflects on Jesus. So we're moving out in a concentric circle today. Last week, we talked about being quick to listen and we talked about being slow to speak. Now, did you all master that, by the way, over the last seven days? You got that, right? Let me just be perfectly frank with you because we're all friends. I think about this a bunch and I'm really trying to work on this because it's really hard for all of us. And usually it affects the people closest to you um, more than, than others. I mean, you're pretty much a maniac if you're running around just insulting and yelling at everybody in your life that you happen to see, just random people at Jordan Creek. I mean, if you're just running around, I mean, eventually you're gonna end up in jail. The world kind of takes care of itself. But I mean, I'm talking about the kind of damage that we do often begins with the people who are closest to us. And it begins with the people who are with whom, within whom our words have the most weight. And most of the time when I think about this and when I've thought about this this week, it's after I've messed up. I don't wanna think about it ahead of time, but it's like, I'll say something. I'm like, "Mm." quick to listen, slow to speak. Rick, why are you so quick to speak and so slow to listen? How have you do? How did you do? Did you do okay? Did you try? Were you applying it as we go? Do you see your relationships becoming a little softer, your heart becoming a little bit more understanding? Do you see yourself becoming a person who you know, feels like you're building up and not tearing down? Do you see Jesus kind of popping up through the cracks and the rough spots and the rough edges? Because that's what this is supposed to do. And this week, it's like um, kindergarten for Christians. We've moved from the basic skills last week to one that's a little more difficult, but yet still a basic skill of human interaction. And when we come back together after singing a couple of songs and we talk about this, you're gonna have to choose just like you did last week. Do I really wanna take this seriously? Do I really wanna grow in this area in my life? Do I wanna live with and under the excuses that I have made for so long that are compelling to me, but obvious to everyone else? Do I wanna let Jesus Christ be fully in charge of my life? Do I want to give the Lord my tongue this Christmas? I wanna pray for you and we're gonna sing. And then after we come back from singing, 
We're going to talk about how the tongue can start a fire and it can spread in a way that cannot be contained. When you think back on your life, can you think of things that were said to you by someone that, um, that went deep, that really hurt, that, um, you know, just going to really hit you just squarely right between the eyes and stayed with you? Again, it's not often, I hope. It's not something that you're keeping a list of and you got it on your phone or in your wallet, but, you know, just things that shaped you, things that changed you. Sometimes it's something somebody says to you when you're a child that um, a lie, maybe, that somebody tells you about yourself that becomes part of your self-image and something you deal with even years and decades later. Maybe it's um, somebody who says that they spoke for God, a pastor, a religious leader who said something to you that drove you away from, from faith, made you judge Jesus based on unkind and hurtful words. When you think about this, it's not really hard for us to, to get the magnitude of what James is saying. But as James kind of turns a corner here, it reminds me a little bit of my youngest son, Nathan, who um, of anybody I know, uh, should be a, a NASCAR driver. The kid can drive anything and he can drive fast and he's in control. Uh, it amazes me, but it also scares me at the same time. And Nathan had a truck that had way too much horsepower and this wasn't too terribly long ago. And he goes, hey, I wanna take you for a ride. And I said, sure, let's go for a ride. So I'm in the truck with Nathan and he looks over at me and we're on this long straightaway down by a river in a different state. And he goes, hey, you wanna see how fast this will go? And I said, no, I do not want to see. And he says, well, I'm fixing to show you. And he dropped the hammer and I grabbed the side. I mean, it, it, I mean, he was fine. We lived, no big deal. He scared me to death. I mean, it went from a drive to a drive. And um, that's what James is doing here. He's like, all right, guys, you want to see how fast this will go? And we're like, mm, no. <laughs> and he's like, well, you're going to see anyway. He has a um, connecting statement here. And in this connecting statement, he says, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but man, it writes big checks. It has great boasts. You ever have a friend in junior high that was always popping off to people and getting themselves in trouble and expecting you to back them up when people came to try to shut their mouths? Um, maybe you didn't, but you get the idea. It's like that person that's always writing huge checks that you're the one having to cash. I mean, your tongue can just get you in trouble. And James says, look, it's little, but do not mistake the fact that it's little. It can't do big damage. And he says, walk with me here. Let's see how fast this thing can go. He says, consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body. It sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. What's the big deal about a fire? James says it, it is like a fire. I mean, I've got fire right here, right? I mean, I can be irritating. I can light the carpet on fire. You guys would put it out. I mean, I could, but I mean, what can this do out of control? I can blow this out, but James isn't talking about a lighter. He's talking about your tongue being able to cause to a spark that creates a forest fire. That once it's out, you can't get back. That can cause irreparable damage to the people who are closest to you, whose lives can be burned to the ground and only grow back over an excruciating amount of time. The tongue can ruin marriages, it can ruin families, it can ruin friendships, it can ruin churches. It can leave scorched earth. And we're responsible for every word. And James says four things about the tongue. He says, first of all, the tongue, well, it's a world in of itself. It's a cosmos, a system that Satan loves to manipulate and use because you never know when a thoughtless word that we might excuse. Well, I didn't mean to say it. Well, you made me mad. Well, I was drunk. Well, I was tired. Well, I was not in my right mind. Well, I just got fired. Well, I, all the excuses, but the words that come out, 
which we may never have intended to cause the kind of damage that they cause, that they do irreparable harm to people who, who we say we love. It's a world, a system that Satan can use. He goes on to talk about how the tongue is a, a stain, a stink. When I was a kid, we had hamsters. And the hamsters sometimes didn't stay in the cage. Anybody ever have hamsters or mice as growing up as kids? You ever lose one in the walls of the house? Anybody? Did it never come back and you knew it was dead because you smelled it? Is that just me? I know that sounds gross to you who are non-pet people. The world is divided by pet people and non-pet people. I get that. And for you non-pet people, you think I'm talking about crazy stuff. For you pet people, you have a hamster. The hamster sneaks away. It doesn't come back. It dies somewhere in your house. You can't get it, but you smell it. And the only way that it quits smelling is when it's done smelling. And friends, it takes forever. You smell death forever. You can't get the stink out. And James compares the tongue, the effects of the tongue to creating a stink. Well, he goes on to say that it is lit on fire perpetually like the fires of Gehenna and the NIV uses the word hell which was the dump that burns with trash outside of Jerusalem that never goes out and he says you want to see how fast this thing can go it goes so fast you can't control it and once it's out and the damage is done you can't get it back like cutting open a feather pillow and throwing the feathers to the wind, then being filled with regret, wishing you could go get every single feather and put them back, but it's impossible, they're gone. So really, I just wanted to think about three different types, because after all, we're gonna be quick to listen, but when we speak, there's three different types of words that can get us in trouble. The first one is angry words. We've talked about that last week. Slow to become angry because human anger doesn't produce righteousness that God desires. Don't be angry. Don't speak when you're angry. Don't say hateful things. Again, this is kindergarten stuff, right? Don't have a potty mouth. Just be kind. Number two, critical words. You and I have talked about this many times on Sunday mornings. We need to stop criticizing. Our words have the power to build up or to tear down. And we are in the building business, not in the business of tearing down. But the words that Paul comes back to so many times and the writer of Psalms and Proverbs comes back to so many times are words that are gonna get a little closer to where we live and that's gossipy words. And gossipy words are so destructive and so dangerous, but yet so enticing. We love a little bit of gossip. Gossip is information that doesn't belong to us that we share. Bad information that we choose to share. Usually bad news that we bear behind somebody's back with a bad intentions and it's out of a bad heart. It's sharing information that doesn't belong to us to somebody who doesn't need to know this information. And Proverbs talks about how the desire to gossip is just so deep. The words of gossip are like choice morsels, like grandma's cookies that she makes at Christmas. And she takes one out of the oven and it's the sugar cookie, just like you like with the sprinkles that are your color. And she hands them to you and says, this one's just for you, Rick. You gotta eat it. I mean, it's your favorite food. The words of gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to a person's innermost parts that there's just something that's so human and it seems so necessary, but at the same time, so sinful about gossip and about trafficking information that doesn't belong to us, about contributing to the destruction of people's lives and assassinating reputations and character. But yet Christians, we do this so often and we're so bad at it. And unfortunately it happens sometimes more when we're around people who we haven't seen for a while gossip. I had somebody one time tell me, it's not gossip if it's true. Yes, it is. It's not your information to share and you don't have any business sharing it. 
from Proverbs, and these scriptures are all in your notes, there are a few types of gossip that we might want to be aware of before we talk about what we're going to do about it. Slander, spreading rumors or lies about a person to intentionally cause damage. Dishing, dishing the dirt means sharing the juicy info you learned about somebody. Rumors, you hear something and it's not good and not necessarily true, but you tell someone or ask someone else just to get more info. You know what I heard? I want to verify this because certainly it's not true, but I heard this about this person and you know, you just sit there and you feast on it. And if you're honest, you know, there's something in you that's like, oh yeah. And that's the evil part that James says that we have to put to death because every word that we say reflects on Jesus. Um, you ever have somebody talk bad about somebody you love? I don't like that at all. You can talk bad about me. I'm used to it. I mean, it might hurt my feelings, but I'll get over it. You talk bad about my wife, we're going to fight. You talk bad about my wife or my kids, I'll go to war. I'm going to stand up for them. And can you imagine how Jesus feels when he's standing by and hears how we talk about other people who he cares about? who he loves, who he stood up for, who he laid his life down for, who he sits at the right hand of God and whose salvation he's sealing and securing, the Holy Spirit who's intercessing, but we're assassinating. Can you imagine how personally Jesus takes that? But yet we just feel like it's all right. Well, I just need to know. Well, you just need to know. No, we don't. Our words build up or they destroy. They build up, they tear down. They encourage, they discourage. They become a spark that can light a fire and that fire can consume. Well, James, is, he's getting in our business and um, I hope this is stinging a little bit because it has for me all week. Backbiting, speaking spiteful or slanderous words about another person who's not present and can do nothing to defend themselves. Whispered innuendo, these are you know, misleading. Misleading others into thinking wrong thoughts, especially the conclusions when they're based on gossipy hunches. You know, like this one. Here's an example, it's an extreme example. Isn't it interesting? He was out of town the night his wife was murdered. I mean, you know, you could say whatever you want and all of a sudden it doesn't have to be true, but it takes on a life of its own and it's ugly and it's nasty and we do it and we shouldn't. And so we have to do something about it. We each have three things that we carry with us. Each of us has a bucket of gasoline. Each of us has a bucket of water. And each of us has some kindling wood, some fire fodder. Now I'm gonna assume that you're not the one spreading the gossip because we're not gonna do that. We're not gonna talk about people who Jesus loves and died for. We're not gonna assassinate and malign. We're not gonna share stories and traffic information that doesn't belong to us. But let's just say somebody comes to you because this is what Christians, we don't do this well at all. This is where we really fall short. Sometimes it's in the guise of prayer requests, right? I need you to pray for somebody because, and then you give them all the gossip and all the dirt and go, oh yes, we need to pray for them. And you can't wait to go tell somebody else you're gonna pray for them. And everybody's really just telling tales, bearing tales about someone, not really ever intending to pray. The prayer chain can be one of the most gossipy places in the world if misplaced or misaligned. But when someone comes to you, we have a choice. We can take that gossip, we can listen to that gossip and we can spread that gossip to somebody else. Oh, I can't wait to go tell such and such. Have you ever heard something about someone and immediately you think of someone you need to tell? Oh man, my wife, she's gonna love this, right? Or I can't wait to go tell, he's gonna love this or she's, she needs to hear this, she hates this person. She's gonna be so happy. We can spread it. We can throw gasoline on it. Whoosh. Or, we can stand by when someone comes and tells us, and this is harder, we can listen to it and not tell them to stop, smile and nod, and not let it go any further really through our mouths, but we throw a little bit of kindling wood on it. And the person who's gossiping takes it on and the fire continues to spread. Or we can take water and we can throw it on the gossip and put it out. How do you do that? Oh, it's my mom, it's my dad, it's my brother, it's my sister, it's my aunt, my uncle, my cousin who I haven't seen in six years. They're talking to me, it's my best friend, it's the person who I gossip with all the time, it's the lady from work, it's the guy across the hall. What do I do? 
Well, somebody has to break the, the pattern to, to break the chain, and, and perhaps it's something like this. When they come to you and they share something about somebody else to you, you say something positive about that person instead of listening silently to the negative or nodding and thinking about who you're going to share it with next. A compliment that came in as a criticism, a reframing. Well, I really like such and such. I think they're a great person. Or do you know what they did the other day? They helped somebody move or something where you break the pattern or break the chain. Well, did they really do that? Have you asked them that? Do you want me to go with you and we'll talk to them and see what they have to say about it? We should probably go to the source. As Christians, we have the responsibility not just to stand idly by and listen, but to put a stop to it, to protect like someone's speaking about our family. And we're not going to put up with it because Jesus cares about him and he takes it personally. And he's not here in bodily form to throw a bucket of water on this fire. But you and I are. Whoa, this is tough, isn't it? Um, I mean, the Bible talks about this. Wrongdoers eagerly listen to gossip. Liars pay close attention to slander. For lack of wood, the fire goes out. And where there's no whisper, contention quiets down. Every person is responsible for our words and we have a choice. So James comes and kind of concludes this section of the thought. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's restless. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison, like a snake in the mouth looking to bite. Nobody could control it, so we're off the hook, right? No one can control the tongue, no human, so we're off the hook. We can do what we want with our mouths. We can say whatever we want. We can listen to whatever we want. We can assassinate whoever we want. We can have people for lunch, destroy reputations, divide our marriage, our family, our group of friends, our workplace, our church, continue to divide our world. No. James says no human can control the tongue. But why do you think he said no human? Because we're not in the relying on human business. We're in the business of relying on the divine, on the strength that comes from God the Father because of the work of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit and the life of a broken person like me and like you who gets mouthy and says shameful things. And so I take you back to the psalm that I took you to last week one that I encourage you to write down. Now, all these are in your notes and more on the app, the church app. You can download this. But if you're a sticky note kind of person, my wife loves sticky notes. She puts sticky notes on her iPad and on her computer screen and on her phone, loves them. So if you're a sticky note person like my wife, write this down on a sticky note, stick it on the rear view mirror of your car, not over your speedometer, on the rear view mirror, maybe on the mirror in the bathroom where you see this. Put it on your phone if you like to type things in. Remember this because I'm telling you, this is going to help. Psalm 141.3. Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. I love that. I'm a mouthy God. I need somebody to make sure that the stuff in there doesn't come out. The stuff I think I want you to change, but I definitely don't want the stuff to come out before you have time to change it because I'm not in the people destroying business. Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. And here's the way I personalize the prayer. God, please keep me from being critical. I wrote this myself. I mean, you, you write your own if you don't like this one. This is just me. I'm just sharing with you as we all work through this together. God, please keep me from being critical, judgmental, gossiping, or gossipy, or from saying anything that I will regret today. Can you imagine that prayer? That's an audacious, a bodacious prayer, isn't it? God, today, I'm not going to say anything I regret. Can you imagine getting to the end of the day and being able to say, today, I said nothing that I'm going to regret. And I would pat myself on the back. And then within three minutes, I would ruin it. I would blow it. I would say something. And I'd be like, ah, there I go. All right. But can you imagine going on an entire day? I mean, not like a vow of silence where you don't say anything to anyone, but like you're talking to people. You're 30,000 words a day. Come out 
And none of them you wish you hadn't said. Unbelievable, unthinkable. It's my prayer because I believe God can, can do that. Remember, people who control their tongue, they control their whole body. It's as close to perfect and like Jesus as will ever be. So I pray it. God, please keep me from being critical, judgmental, gossipy, or from saying anything that I will regret today. I understand, I accept that my words are a reflection on Jesus that people who hear me speak will make decisions about who Jesus is based on what comes out of my mouth and your mouth. And there's no timeouts. I'm not speaking about Jesus right now. This is just Rick and give it to him. Uh-uh. We're saved and our salvation is permanent. It's fixed. It's secure. But there's no timeouts. There's no breaks. And we don't get to step away and say, no, this isn't Jesus. This is just me. Everything we say reflects on our Father. And people decide if they want a relationship with him by what they hear us say and how we talk about each other. Please keep me from being critical, judgmental, gossipy, or from saying anything that I will regret today. I understand that my words are a reflection on Jesus. And then here's my favorite part of this entire prayer, and I need your help. So, what are you going to do this week? Well, we're going to make sure that we remember what we talked about last week, which is I'm going to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, even when you're driving, even when there's morons in front of you and boneheads and people that are just messing with you, even when God has put people in your life just to make you mad, when it's a test itself, what? You're gonna be slow to become angry because human anger doesn't produce the righteousness that God requires. And this week, we're gonna realize and remember that, that the tongue has the power to confuse when we say that we speak for God, but we misuse scripture to coerce, control, or bully. We're gonna remember that the tongue has the power to control and it reveals the heart. But what I really want us to remember and think about is that with our tongues, we have a way to be involved in protecting and preserving the people who are around us by putting a stop to all the nasty and negative and unnecessary commentary that's trafficked so freely out of our sinful nature. So this week, no angry words, no critical words, and no gossipy words. And we're gonna wrap our mouths up with wrapping paper and a bow, and we're gonna give them to Jesus this Christmas. And if we're doing it right, we're gonna let him keep them the entire year. Father, thank you for the time that we've spent today already. And Lord, the conversations that we've had are, uh, they're hard. I imagine some of my friends here and listening online are just struggling with the concept of gossip and whether or not it really is this serious and sinful and kind of kicking it around and that's fair. But I pray, Father, that you would reveal to them how seriously you take it by revealing the heart of Jesus to my friends who are listening. I pray, Father, that you would give us the strength to control our tongues, that you would give us the restraint, the foresight to be quick to listen and understand, to be slow to speak words that leave grace and peace and truth and love. And that this holiday season, when tensions rise, when opinions rage, that by the way we conduct ourselves, the way we choose our words, that people will see Jesus in us and they'll find hope. We can't do it ourselves, but you can do it through us. And that's my prayer. 
It's my prayer this Christmas season for myself and my friends in Jesus' name. Amen.